Hello, my name is Christina Guzman. Today we're going to be talking about the four most common surgical trays that a medical assistant will be setting up in a doctor's office. It's very important for the medical assistant to understand the equipment that is used on these trays and how to set them up properly on the tray. You really want to make sure that you have your equipment set on time, ready for the doctor to go. Don't worry about it, talk you through it, let's get started. The first tray we're going to be doing today is the incision and drainage tray. Okay, this tray is usually performed on patients that come in uh, that have something called an abscess. An abscess is a little bit of pus that is accumulated underneath the skin in the cavity, which is usually caused by a local infection, spider bite, infected hair follicle, or some other type of bacteria. So what the doctor needs to do is make an incision and actually drain all that pus out that can be very infectious. The first thing that we're gonna do now, I already have my gloves on. Make sure that before you put your gloves on, you are, have already washed your hands, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is grab my um, sterile field, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and lay out a drape here that has to maintain uh, sterile, very important, okay? So when you open this, you wanna be very careful because you can only touch the corners, all right? You wanna really maintain the integrity of that field. So we're gonna go ahead and open it up. And you'll notice that the corners can already see kind of where you're able to touch. Spread this out. The blue is always going to go towards the bottom, the white on top. Now I'm going to demonstrate what is actually going to be placed onto your sterile field. Okay, sterile gauze, sterile instruments. I'm going to go ahead and start off with the sterile gauze. So when you open up this autoclave package, you want to make sure that you don't touch the contents inside because it's all sterile. So when you open this here, you just kind of want to flip them onto the tray, not reaching over or reaching to touch them because you don't want to contaminate your field. Same thing with the instruments. Open up a little package. And you want to try to kind of lay your instruments across as best as possible. A couple other things that are going to be not on your sterile tray, but an easy to reach area. Additional types of supplies that the doctor might need. The most commonly used antiseptics for this procedure are iodine and hydrogen peroxide. Now, depending on the physician's preference, you might have to hold these and assist, or some physicians like you to actually pour the contents onto the sterile field. Let's go ahead and start with the iodine. Now, you notice I have three separate stacks of gauze left on the sterile field. You want one for the iodine, one for the peroxide, and one just left dry, just in case. Keep in mind, when you pour this on here for the physician, what you mainly want to focus on is that you're, you're not reaching over or touching the field, because then you can contaminate. So you want to maintain a level of distance. I personally like to at least be at shoulder level, okay? So when you're pouring the contents directly the gauze just like that. So there goes down our iodine, hydrogen peroxide, and the last one would be left dry. So depending on the physician's preference, either they want the fluids on the tray or off to the side. Okay. Some physicians might actually choose to grab their own gauze and actually dip them into the contents. A couple other pieces of equipment, one of them is the sterile fenestrated drape. Now what this is, it's exactly the way the sterile field is here. The only difference is that this has a hole right in the middle of the drape. So it has a, a little circular opening. And this is going to be used just in case the physician wants to sterilize the area of the abscess. Uh, we'll ask to open it and actually place it right over the abscess so it sterilizes, it creates a sterile field on the patient. Another thing that you want to have on hand as well is some additional sterile gauze. Now this is just kept handy if the doctor notices that there's a large accumulation of pus, um, a large amount of blood that it needs to soak up and clean the area, so that will use sterile gauze. Of course you want to have these ready for the doctor. 
sterile gloves that the doctor will use to make sure that he or she maintains the sterile field. We also have some sterile water or normal saline, which is used just in case the doctor needs to cleanse another area, irrigate an area. So this is also just kept on the side. We also have our local anesthetic, which is lidocaine in most cases. But this is going to use to actually numb the area before the doctor does the incision. And you also want to have a couple diff different sizes of syringes and needles. So you want to have a syringe that is going to be used for the doctor to aspirate the anesthetic. Also, you want to have the needles that attach to that syringe. Two different sizes of needles is best. One a larger size needle to draw up the actual anesthetic and another size needle a little bit smaller to inject the patient with the anesthetic. Couple other things to also have on hand here. This is a sterile cotton tip applicator. Physicians might choose to use this to help with the packing. Also here we have a sterile culture swab which would be used if the doctor wants to do a, a culture swab of the actual pus or the fluid that comes out once it is drained. Many times if the doctor wants to know what type of infection or what type of specific microorganism is causing that, they'll use it for testing purposes. For example, if they want to see if it's a staph infection, MRSA, uh, strep infection, uh, they'll be more specific by doing a culture swab and sending it to the lab. And then of course, rather than leaving just an open hole there, the doctor needs to pack it. And what that does is it heals it from the inside out. And a lot of times the patient has to come back a couple days after to remove and get a new pack and insert it until it heals completely. And then towards the end, once the procedure is completely done, you have some uh, dressing supplies here. The physician might ask you to go ahead and dress up the wound and provide some follow-up care instructions. But you have some zinc oxide ointment here. This all depends on your physician's preference. Sometimes they like to use saxitracin or some other type of uh, antibiotic ointment. And then you have your bandage dressing. So that way it just doesn't stay open. You want to maintain the wound closed. And that's pretty much it for the incision and drainage tray. Now the next tray that I'm going to be demonstrating is called the excisional surgical tray. This tray is mainly used in urgent care type settings, minor surgery, and sometimes even dermatology. The patient will possibly have maybe a birthmark, mole, or a cyst that needs to be removed and sent in to do a biopsy to check for malignancies such as cancer. It's very similar to the incision and drainage tray with just some minor differences. Now with this tray, the main components are, are very similar. We have our sterile drape out, our hands are gloved, and our hands have been washed. So the same piece of equipment that we had for our IND tray, we have our sterile gauze and our sterile instruments. And we have one added piece of equipment now, which is our punch biopsy. Toss that on there. And our punch biopsy is actually going to be used to remove the piece of tissue and that piece of tissue is then going to be put into a specimen container with a preservative and then sent off to the lab. One thing to keep in mind is that this preservative formalin, for the most part, will already come prepackaged in a container, so the MA doesn't have to worry about filling or pouring formalin in here. In most cases, it'll already come in its own container. You just have to label it and submit it to the lab. But just in case, there are some offices that might have it uh, the formalin separate on hand where you actually have to pour it in. And you just want to remember to keep in mind, you don't want to completely fill it in, just enough to submerge the tissue sample with the preservative. Now the equipment that we have off to the side here is almost identical to the incision and drainage tray, with one exception, and I'll talk to you about that in just a second. We have our surgical sterile gloves, the sterile gauze, some alcohol prep pads, just in case iodine and hydrogen peroxide, normal saline, local anesthetic, a syringe and needles, our dressing supplies, gauze, tape, and our antibiotic ointment. 
The main difference here with this tray are our sutures. The reason we have sutures here is because when the physician makes the incision with the scalpel to remove that piece of tissue with the biopsy punch, there is an open wound now or a laceration. So the doctor needs to suture that up. The type of suture really depends on the preference of the physician. Some physicians choose to have you open this up and keep it on the field. Personally, I don't like to do that because the physician can change his mind and say, you know what, give me a smaller size, give me a different size. So keep this on hand with a couple of different options and then your physician will let you know what size sutures he or she will want to use. The next tray that I'm going to be demonstrating is the pelvic examination and pap smear. Now you'll typically see this procedure being done in OBGYN, family practice, and in some cases an urgent care type setting if the patient comes in with a chief complaint such as vaginal irritation, discharge, or abnormal bleeding. Now if you notice here, this tray is a little bit different than the ones we talked about previously. This specific tray is not sterile. And the reason that it's not sterile is the risk of infection is a lot less and it's a non-invasive procedure. We're not cutting into tissue or anything of that nature. The only thing that the doctor is doing in a pap smear is obtaining a sample from the cervix, specifically on the surface cells, to send for testing for malignancies, cancers. Now when it comes to the pap test, there's two different types that you can use. The first one that I'm gonna talk about is the pap pack. Now the pap pack, when you open it, it'll already come with all the equipment that is needed, okay? So you wanna go ahead and put it off to the side there. Now you'll notice here that in each pap pack, you'll have a set of directions. So you can follow those directions if you ever have to come back to it, but I will guide you through it step by step. First thing that you wanna do is grab this little packet here, okay, which is the fixative, also known as the preservative. So you wanna go ahead and rub that along the glass slide there. The physician will then get the samples that he or she needs, rub them on the glass slide, some more sample, put it on the slide again, and one more sample on the slide. Now before you package this up, you wanna keep one thing in mind. Right in the corner up here, you wanna write in the patient's name and date of birth. Now it's very important that you do this in pencil. The reason is, if you do it in pen, the fixative or the preservative will, will smear it off, okay? So you're gonna go ahead and package that up, and it's gonna look just like this, ready to be sent off to the lab. Double check and make sure that the patient's name and information is on there. Now the next one is the thin prep. The thin prep, you wanna just go ahead and uncap and have it open there for the doctor. So same concept with a pat pack. This is a little spatula here that the physician is gonna get the samples and mix it in here into the preservative. Same thing, grab a couple more samples, some secretions there, mix it in there to the preservative. And then you're gonna cap this put a label on it with the patient's information, and then send it off to the lab. So, I wanna go ahead and uh, kinda take you through this and explain the difference in equipment that you'll need here. Two pairs of gloves, in case the doctor needs to change gloves, one will be here already prepared. Some surgical lubricant, okay? Depending on the doctor's preference, you might have it on the tray, or some might actually want you to pour it onto the tray so it could be ready. You also have the vaginal speculum, which is disposable, and this is what's actually gonna be inserted into the vagina for visualization and to obtain the cells. And also some cotton tip applicators, just in case the patient has any abnormal discharge or bleeding that the doctor needs to clean off. And finally, we have the examination light, which is going to illuminate the walls of the vagina.
The last tray we're going to do today is the colposcopy and cervical biopsy. Now this tray is usually done in gynecology and it's kind of a follow-up procedure to an abnormal pap. So what the doctor is going to do is obtain a biopsy or a piece of tissue from the cervix and send it in to test for malignancies and cancer. So let's go ahead and get started. As you notice here, this specific tray is sterile, so you notice I already have my sterile field in place. Gloves are already on, hands have already been washed. So I'm going to go ahead and put the sterile equipment that's going to go on this tray, starting with the sterile gauze. Now you notice that I have a little bit more uh, gauze laid out on this tray, just in case there's a little bit more blood or discharge or anything that the, doc the doctor needs to clean up. Okay. We also have some sterile cotton tip applicators for the same purpose. Lay those out on there. And then we have some forceps, also known as dressing forceps. We also have the uterine forceps, also known as the tenaculum, and the uterine biopsy forceps. What we also need here is the vaginal speculum. Now, you're going to open up the bag, right, and pour it onto your sterile field. A couple of similar things that we've seen already, surgical gloves for the doctor, our antiseptics, iodine, hydrogen peroxide, our normal saline, some lubricant, and we have our specimen container with the preservative formalin for the sample biopsy to get sent to the lab. Now the doctor is going to be using an instrument called a colposcope. Now that instrument is going to go into the vagina and illuminate and magnify the cervix to better help the doctor visualize in obtaining that tissue sample. So the doctor is going to use the biopsy forceps to remove a sample of tissue whereas the medical assistant's role would be more assisting on the side for whatever the doctor needs as far as handing the tools and definitely obtaining that sample into the container with a preservative and sending it off to the lab. Okay, we just covered a lot of detailed information. We learned how to set up four different trays. Couple things to keep in mind. Make sure that you're cleaning up the way you should. If it goes in biohazards, if it goes in sharps, make sure you dispose of them correctly. Also, make sure that you remember all of your documentation and if you need to set anything to the lab, that you send it accordingly. Dates, times, everything filled out. Now, Three important tips to keep in mind. Number one, if it's supposed to be sterile, make sure it's sterile. Number two, if you have any tools, make sure that they are the correct and accurate tools for the procedure. And number three, get to know your doctor. Ask questions or you can watch me again.